English martyrs. Those who will destroy our church have forgotten the price we have paid for her. This is a story of men who will not compromise their church, not even for the king and country they dearly loved. How does a just king, a loyal defender of the faith, turn on all that he vowed to protect, betraying church and country? Was it the limitless power he had, the power to decide between life and death, that gave birth to him placing himself above his pope and church? Was it the example of other Henrys before him? This chapter is about one man's infamy and the powerful men and martyrs God raised up to defend his church. But before we speak of King Henry VIII and the martyrs who died rather than deny the church, we want to touch briefly on some of his predecessors. Henry II, Emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, who became emperor in 1056 at the age of six years old, fought against Pope Gregory VII. The Pope excommunicated him. What did that Henry do? He went to Canosa, Italy, where the Pope was living. It was winter and there was snow on the ground. He stood outside the Pope's castle donned in coarse sackcloth for three days in the bitter cold. The Pope forgave him and took him back into the church. This Henry's reign was filled not only with battles against the German kings and the Pope, but against his own sons. Had he taught them through his disobedience to the foster father that Jesus had left, the successor to Peter, the Pope, they did not have to respect and obey him, their earthly father? And so, once again, disobedience breeds disobedience and division. A new Henry will disobey, but he will not beg forgiveness, and the innocents will suffer. St. Thomas Becket, Martyr of the Middle Ages, 1118-1170 Thomas Becket was born on the feast day of St. Thomas the Apostle in 1118. He lost both his parents when he was 21. He was educated with the canons regular. At 24, he obtained a position in the home of the Archbishop of Canterbury. He received minor orders. The Archbishop was so fond of him, Thomas obtained many favors. He was ordained deacon in 1154, and then the Archbishop appointed him Archdeacon of Canterbury. Now this was an important position, second only to that of a bishop or abbot. The Archbishop entrusted his most delicate affairs to him to manage, seldom doing anything without asking his advice. He sent him to Rome on a very important mission. Thomas Becket never gave the Archbishop cause to regret the confidence he placed in him. Thomas Becket was the kind of man monarchs liked to have around them. He spoke frankly, had the gift of discernment, and an understanding so profound he was always able to answer difficult questions plainly and simply. It, it was his diplomacy that swayed blessed Pope Eustace III to discourage the succession to the throne to Stephen's son, making the crown secure for Henry of Anjou. Later, as King Henry II, he will appoint Becket at age 36 as his chancellor. Thomas Becket not only served the king well and faithfully, but became his intimate friend. They are said to have had one heart and one mind. He influenced King Henry to bring about much-needed reforms, but their friendship went beyond their common interest in affairs of state. They were friends who enjoyed one another. They laughed together. They had fun together. Thomas Becket had an entourage almost as large and grand as the king himself. As chancellor, he led a predominantly secu secular, grandiose existence. He was proud and arrogant. But there was another side to Thomas Becket, the man who went on retreats, would subject himself to heavy penitential disciplines, was spotted praying during his night watches. His confessor said that at the beginning of his career, Becket's life was blameless. Even under the most menacing circumstances and enticements. The Archbishop of Canterbury died in 1161. King Henry wanted to raise Becca to that position, but he protested that if he became Archbishop, they would lose their close friendship. Their friendship would turn 
from love into hatred. He told his friend and king that, as archbishop, he will not condone the things he does against the church. King Henry will not listen to any of Thomas Becket's arguments, but Becket was resolved until Cardinal Henry of Pisa, legate from the Holy See, overruled his objections as over a scrupulosity. He was elected in 1162 and set out to Canterbury from London. On the way, he reached out humbly to several of his priests from his church to alert him when they detect any faults in his character or conduct. He was ordained priest on Saturday of Wheat Week, and on the octave of Pentecost, he was consecrated bishop of Rochester. Something happened to Thomas Becket when he received the pallium from Pope Alexander III. By the end of the year, there was a visible change. He wore a hair shirt next to his skin. No more fancy clothes for him. He donned the plain cassock of a parish priest. He rose early in the morning and read Holy Scriptures. At nine each morning, he sang Holy Mass or was present when another priest celebrated. He gave twice the alms to the poor his predecessor had given. He took a nap in the afternoon, and when he dined with guests and his household, instead of music, a spiritual book was read. Although he was generous with portions for his guests, he ate moderately. He visited the infirmary, and the monks who worked in the cloister each day. He personally screened and interviewed candidates for the priesthood. He became a priest and a bishop. Although he resigned as chancellor, after he was raised to archbishop, he and the king remained the good friends they had always been, until they had their first disagreement. It was customary for each landowner and farmer to pay two shillings a year for each hide on their land to the local sheriffs of the counties, for protection against unsavory local officials. It was graft of the worst kind. This sum was then ordered to be paid into the king's exchequer. The archbishop argued that this was a voluntary payment and could not be exacted as revenue by the crown. He added, if the sheriffs defended the people, they would pay, otherwise no. The king was furious and swore by God's eyes this shall be paid, to which Becket retorted, by the reverence of those eyes, my lord king. Henry did not press on, but a chasm grew between them that would become too wide to cross. There were many battles fought as the friend became more and more the bishop. When a cleric was accused of wrongdoing, the archbishop insisted they be tried before his court. The king accused him of showing clemency because he was a priest. October 1163, the king called the bishops to a council and ordered all clerics accused of crimes to be handed over to the civil courts to be tried and punished. When the bishops began to weaken, Archbishop Beckett pressed them to remember they were pledged to protect their priest, ensuring they would be treated fairly, that they were sons of the bishops, and if punishment was to be enacted, it was the place of their bishop to do it. The king ordered all the bishops to observe his mandates. St. Thomas and the other bishops agreed, but with a qualification, saving their order. The king took this as a refusal, and the next day ordered Thomas Becket to relinquish certain castles and honors bestowed upon him as chancellor. The king, remembering their friendship, tried in vain to, go, to get Becket to change his stand, and accept his conditions. For a while, because of little encouragement from Pope Alexander III, Thomas Becket agreed to accept the royal customs. But when he read the provisions of the constitutions which contained the royal customs, he refused once again to affix his seal to the documents. Areas he strenuously objected to were, no prelate could leave the kingdom without the royal license or appeal to Rome without the king's consent, no one could be excommunicated without the royal will. It went from bad to worse, but the crowning blow was that clerics convicted and sentenced by ecclesiastical courts had to be turned over to the civil jurisdiction of the royal officers and would be exposed to possible double punishment. 
There was no chance of reconciliation between Becket and the king. The king made false claims of money due the crown, which he had already discharged. He added fines for Becket not appearing in his court. He went on and on. When he was ordered to pay up or face judgment, Becket said he will not be judged by anyone but by the Pope who solely had jurisdiction over him. He left the court with shouts of traitor following him and some from fellow bishops who chose to serve men rather than God. Becket left for France where the Pope was staying. The bishops and members of the king's court arrived before Becket and having accused him, left before he reached the Pope. When Becket arrived, he showed the Pope the sixteen constitutions. The Pope not only agreed they were intolerable, but severely chastised Becket for compromising in the first place. Becket kneeled before the Pope and accused himself of having received the see of Canterbury uncanonically. Although it was against his will, he confessed he shared in the sin and removed his bishop's ring and left the Pope's presence. The Pope called him back and reinstated Becket, only now canonically, as Archbishop, insisting that for him to refuse will be to abandon the cause of God. Becket went to a Cistercian monastery to do penance for his sins. In the meantime, the king confiscated all his property and that of his family, friends, and domestics. He sent them to France so that Becket, seeing them, would be moved and returned to England and the king's judgment. In addition, the king advised the general chapter of Cistercians that he would confiscate all their property within his realm if Becket remained at the monastery. The abbot can hardly be blamed for kind of hinting that perhaps Becket should leave the monastery. After nearly six years of haggling with the king of France, now brought into the struggle, King Henry and Thomas Becket met and reconciled. The streets leading to Canterbury were lined with cheering faithful welcoming their archbishop back. But Becket had made enemies of the other bishops and they would not rest until he was removed. At the court of King Henry, someone exclaimed, There will not be any peace for the realm while Becket lived. And then King Henry, in one of his un uncontrollable rages, repeated, Who will rid me of this turbulent priest? The words no sooner out, he and his heart knew he will regret them over and over again. His words will soon become a reality. The archbishop received a letter warning him of his danger. Four knights arrived from England and insisted he remove the cinchers from th three of his bishops. When he refused, they threatened and swore they would return, and return they did, but not before the archbishop's men hustled him off to the church. The frightened monks in the church bolted the door quickly behind the archbishop, locking out some of their monks. The archbishop insisted they unlock the doors and allowed the monks to enter. He remonstrated them, saying, This is a church, not a castle. Petrified with fear, all fled, leaving the archbishop alone, with only one monk staying behind. The knights, joined by a subdeacon, shouted, Where is Thomas, the traitor? Becket replied he was no traitor, but an archbishop and priest of God. One of the knights responds to his question, Reginald, you have received many favors from me. Why do you come into my church armed? Was for the knight to swing his axe menacingly at the archbishop. St. Thomas spoke, I am ready to die, but God's curse be on you if you harm my people. One of the knights drew his sword and struck St. Thomas' head and blood ran down his face. St. Thomas cried out, into your hands I commend my spirit. They struck him again with the sword, bringing him down on his knees. He gasped, For the name of Jesus and in defense of the church, I am willing to die. With that, he fell forward and a knight struck him another blow, severing his scalp. The subdeacon scattered his archbishop's brains with his sword, and the cowards ran out shouting, the king's men, the king's men. For a long while, no one dared touch the archbishop's body, but he will not be left for long. 
Before dawn began to cut through the dark night, people began calling him martyr and saint. They dipped clots in his blood that would be used as relics, and miracles began to happen immediately. The indignation over an archbishop being murdered in his own church spread throughout Europe, and there was widespread clamoring for the canonization of Thomas Beckett. The indignant, outraged people of the world demanded no less than a most humiliating form of public penance for King Henry. The king, for his part, although he never meant for Beckett to be killed, grieved and fasted for 40 days. July 1174, 18 months after Thomas Beckett was solemnly canonized as a martyr by Pope Alexander, King Henry went to the cathedral where his friend and archbishop had been slain and humbly did public penance. July 7, 1220, St. Thomas' body was solemnly processed from its tomb in a crypt to a shrine behind the main altar. This became one of the most visited shrines by pilgrims of the Christian world. The Feast of St. Thomas of Canterbury, as St. Thomas Becket is known, has been kept throughout the church from the very beginning, and in England he is venerated as protector of the secular clergy. King Henry IV The rulers of England declared themselves the rightful rulers of France, and by 1422, England had overrun most of northern France, including Paris, and were heading southward. The ruler of France was the weak King Charles, but the Lord raised up a saint who would become a martyr, sold out by the French king she had helped and by another king, King Henry's decree. She, like the other martyrs in this book, had heard the word of the Lord and said yes. St. Jean d'Arc was burned at the stake. It was during the reign of King Henry IV that a saint was put to death for listening to the Lord. 500 years later, she was officially proclaimed a saint by the church she loved. What was the legacy and example left by the English king? More martyrs to be perpetuated by his successors. And so, once Pandora's box of power was opened, another King Henry will dip into it, and hate and division will be the sad struggle of England and her cousins on the British Isle for centuries. The martyrs in this book follow the love perpetuated by their king, our Lord Jesus Christ and his successors, and we, their heirs, can do no less. King Henry VIII On May 30th, 1431, Jean d'Arc died and by 1491, a new king will be born who will be responsible not only for the martyrs we will speak about in this chapter, but be the catalyst for the ongoing martyrdom of so many more. Some of this you will read about in our chapter on the Irish martyrs. King Henry, when you faced our Lord Jesus, which were the crimes revealed that so deeply touched you that you condemned yourself? Was it the men who had dearly loved you and you condemned to death because they could not be a party to your sin? Or was it the rift and division caused by your avarice and selfishness that would pit brother against brother for centuries and centuries, the bloodshed never ending? The saddest reaction to King Henry's action was the part he would play in leading his faithful innocent subjects unknowingly away from their beloved church. They never knew what hit them. They loved them. They trusted him. He was their king. The people of England have always loved the monarchy, willing to accept whatever hardships necessary for king or queen and country. They had been so proud when King Henry VIII was proclaimed defender of the faith by Pope Leo X. They will never be able to accept that he will do anything against them and their immortal souls, no less attack the church he had pledged to defend. When did it all start? When did the defender of the faith turn from a loyal son of the church to heretic schismatic? When his brother King Henry VII died, King Henry married his widow, the Spanish princess Catherine of Aragon. They had a daughter, Mary, who would later become Queen of England. But that was not good enough for the king. He wanted a son who will someday carry on as King of England. When Catherine failed to give him sons, he decided to divorce her and marry Anne Boleyn. 
He asked the Pope to nullify his marriage to Catherine, declare it illegal that it never existed. Of course, the Pope refused. Now, that was not easy to do. King Henry had defended the church against Luther, saving the faithful of England from falling into heresy. But the Pope had no choice. Jesus had said it, and he had to obey. What God has joined together, let not men put asunder. When the Pope refused to condone his plan, King Henry VIII set up his own church and declared himself head of his newly founded church, the Church of England. King Henry VIII married the English Anne Boleyn, who later proved disappointed by giving Henry a girl instead of a boy. Her name was Elizabeth. She would later become Queen Elizabeth I. After three short years, poor Anne Boleyn lost favor with the king. She had failed to give him any sons. He accused her of misconduct and had her beheaded. He then married Anne Seymour, who finally gave him the son he so ardently desired. The baby was named Edward. He later became King Edward VI. Well, Anne Seymour did not live long enough to suffer the fate of those others who had not met the king's expectations. She died giving birth to Edward. Henry was to go through wife after wife, dissolving marriage after marriage by simply declaring it never existed, nullifying it, or by beheading the wife who lost favor. But as our Lord would have forgiven Judas if he had only repented as Peter had, our Lord sent men to King Henry to stand firm in trying to keep him from doing this heinous act that would reverberate so much pain and division. They were sent to him to save his soul, but the self-indulgence and gluttony he practiced, putting himself before and above others, will become an addiction that could not be satisfied or arrested. One of the men our Lord sent was John Fisher. St. John Fisher, Cardinal and Martyr, 1469-1535 We are in the year 1469. The church will be attacked brutally once again, and God will raise up saints who will defend the church and shed their blood, if need be. John Fisher was to be one of those saints. He was born into a poor family. He lost his father when he was very young. Yet he entered Cambridge University at the age of 14. He was a fine scholar, excelling in school. So outstanding were his accomplishments, he was ordained a priest by special permission when he was merely 22 years old. King Henry VII was king. His mother met John Fisher, and when she soon became aware of his piety and wisdom, she chose him to be her spiritual director. Through John Fisher's influence, the king's mother spent her remaining years dedicating her life to God. She encouraged students eager to learn. She used her wealth to help them financially as well. Through him, she also became patroness of Cambridge University. In 1504, John Fisher was elected Chancellor of Cambridge. His great works and pastoring skills came to the attention of King Henry VII, who recommended he be ordained a bishop. He was only 35 years old. Now, John Fisher did not want to take on this added responsibility, fearing it would take away from his commitment to Cambridge. But we have an expression, doers do. If you want a job done, call on someone who is busy. John Fisher never neglected his duties at Cambridge and yet spiritually ministered to his diocese tirelessly and wisely. Neither of his appointed tasks suffered because of the other. When Luther and his schismatic doctrines were infiltrating London and the universities, John Fisher wrote many volumes successfully refuting Luther's heresies. His books were the first published defending the church against Luther's attack on the faith. When King Henry VII and his mother died, St. John Fisher sadly preached at their funeral masses. With King Henry VII's death, King Henry VIII became the new monarch. He recognized the outstanding qualities his mother and brother had experienced, and he proclaimed John Fisher the finest prelate to be found in any kingdom in the world. Upon his brother's death, King Henry VIII married his brother's widow, Catherine of Aragon. 
taking her as his first wife. Everything went well until she made the fatal mistake of giving birth to a daughter who would later become Queen Mary I. This became a giant problem. She had not given the king a son. Out she goes. He decided to divorce her and take a new wife, Anne Boleyn. The Pope refused the king's request to have the marriage nullified, and King Henry VIII left the church and began his own church, the Church of England. Now he will be free to marry Anne Boleyn, and he will have the male heir he desired. John Fisher was chosen to defend Catherine. He stood before the court and ably presented the argument that the marriage was valid and could not be nullified by any power, human or divine. He gave St. John the Baptist as an example, who had been beheaded because he had come against King Herod, who had defiled the sanctity of marriage. When this reached the king, he became furious. The case went to Rome. John Fisher no longer had any connection with it. You would think that would be the end of it, wouldn't you? After all, John Fisher had done all he could to stop the king from sinning against God and his church. He had defended the sacrament of matrimony. But now, the next step our Lord would call him to was to defend the rights of the Roman Catholic Church and the Pope. In order for his subjects to accept him and his new church, the king knew he had to have the clergy behind him. After all, to the people, they were their teachers and were respected as the faithful pastors down of the Lord's word and church. King Henry issued a decree forcing his priests to pledge loyalty to the Church of England and to King Henry as the rightful head of the church. John Fisher denounced the courts that were passing down these dictates from the king. He could not stand silent while the king and his courts denied the Roman Catholic Church as the true church and the Pope as the rightful head of the church. As a member of the House of Lords, he denounced the measures that were being instituted against the clergy down through the commons, loudly crying out, It is nothing but down with the church. He persistently denied the king's claim as head of the church in England. His friends tried to warn him to back off a little. He couldn't. Twice he was imprisoned. They tried to poison him. He was shot at through his window in his study. They even tried to smear his name. Things never stand still. Bishop Fisher was summoned to appear at a meeting concerning a bill which will declare that children resulting from the king's marriage to Anne Boleyn will be rightful successors to the throne of England after his death. Although so ill he fainted on the way to the meeting, Bishop Fisher attended. It would have been a valid excuse to not go and probably save his life. Because with every motion against the wishes of the king, he was driving another nail into his coffin. Now, like St. Thomas More, John Fisher did not object to the succession in itself. But unlike the other bishops of England, he refused to take the oath as he declared recognition of King Henry as supreme head of the church. He did not condemn his fellow bishops for taking the oath, saying, Their conscience will save them, and mine must save me. The king removed him as bishop and had John Fisher imprisoned in the Tower of London on April 26, 1534. On May 21st of the following year, Pope Paul III raised him to cardinal. This infuriated King Henry and hastened the end of John Fisher. Furiously he barked, let the Pope send him a hat. I will make sure that when it comes, they will have to place it on his shoulders as he will no longer have a head to set it on. On June the 17th, he was brought before 13 commissioners and a jury of freeholders. The physical abuse showed tragically on his entire body. He looked closer to 86 than his 66 years. His health, already weakened by his austere life, had seriously deteriorated during his stay in the Tower of London. But that did not stop him from being his cheerful self as his indictment was read. There was a peace that emanated from him. His eyes glowed as he appeared to be looking beyond them to his source of true peace, his Lord. Although quite lengthy in essence, 
The indictment called him a traitor, declaring that he maliciously and falsely stated that the king, our sovereign lord, is not supreme head on earth of the Church of England. When he was finished reading the charges against Bishop John Fisher, the court clerk demanded, What say you? Are you guilty of high treason? John Fisher, with a voice that be belied his feeble frame, answered strongly and resolutely, not guilty. Now the king has sent his personal solicitor general, Richard Rich, to speak to John Fisher in the tower before the trial. Now he was the sole witness testifying against Bishop Fisher. It was he who had stated that Bishop Fisher had maliciously made statements by which he now stood accused of treason. John Fisher spoke directly to him. He stated, If he had expressed his feelings on King Henry VIII as head of the church in England, as Richard Rich had accused him of doing, he had not spoken with treason in his mind or heart. He reminded Richard Rich that he knew well that he, the king's solicitor, had come to him privately as a representative of the king, and that he had told John Fisher that the king had sent him to ask John Fisher for his, the king's own, conscience. What Fisher truly believed about his supremacy. He asked him if he did not recall how he had assured the bishop that his words will not be held against him and that his answer will be transmitted strictly to the king and no one else. Although John Fisher argued brilliantly before, the commission and the jury that he could not be judged based on his on this testimony as he was based on advice and counsel given solely to the king, it did not sway the commissioners on their verdict. Even his argument that the testimony of one man was not sufficient to prove him guilty of treason fell on deaf ears. The commissioners insisted, in the case of a king, it was not up to the law, but to the consciences of the jury, all of which would not have dared to find Bishop Fisher anything but guilty if they did not want to join him. It had been a long accepted conclusion that the king's will was the law in any case. You see, he already had set himself as divine. The commissioners berated Bishop Fisher for his obstinacy in opposing the king's claim as head of the church in England. They said that he alone, of all the bishops of the realm, stood against Parliament and their ruling on the king's supremacy. Bishop Fisher retorted that he stood with all the bishops of the Catholic world and all the faithful of the one holy universal Roman Catholic Church in swearing allegiance to no one but the Pope as head of the church. The 12 jurors returned after a short time of deliberation with the verdict, guilty of treason. When asked if he had anything further to say, John Fisher replied, If what I have spoken is not sufficient, then I have no more to say, except to beg Almighty God to forgive those who have condemned me, as they know not what they have done. The Lord Chancellor pronounced sentence, You shall be led to the place from where you came, and from there shall be drawn through the city to the place of execution at Tyburn, where you shall be hanged by the neck, and being half alive, you shall be cut down and thrown to the ground. Your bowels to be taken out of your body and burnt before you, while still alive. You are to be decapitated, your head separated from the rest of your body, which then will be drawn in quarter, after which the king will decide where your head and four quarters of your body will be set up, and God have mercy on your soul. Some of the judges cried when the sentence was read. Before being taken back to the tower, John Fisher addressed the commissioners one more time, formally stating that not King Henry or any other sovereign can ever be head of the church in England or anywhere else. Four days later, the king issued orders for his execution, but not according to the prescribed sentence, but by beheading. The next morning, the lieutenant of the tower came to Bishop Fisher's room. He was sleeping peacefully. The lieutenant awakened him and told him he was to be executed that morning. The bishop asked the lieutenant to convey his thanks to the king for ridding him of all this worldly business. 
He then calmly asked him the hour of his execution. When the lieutenant replied it was to be at nine in the morning, Bishop John Fisher asked him what time it was. Upon hearing it was about five o'clock, he requested he be able to sleep another hour or two, as he had not slept much during the night. He assured him that he was not out of fear of dying. He wanted to sleep a little more, but because of his infirmity had left him weak, he would need to if he was to be able to walk to his death. The lieutenant shared that the king had expressly ordered the bishop to, to say little and nothing that might lead the people to believe that the king was acting wrongly. The bishop assured the lieutenant that no one would mistake his words or their meaning, not the king or anyone else. Two hours later, the lieutenant returned and awakened the bishop for the last time. The bishop called to his band servant and asked him to help him up. He ordered him to remove his hair shirt and hide it. He dressed carefully, donning his very finest clothes. When his man servant questioned him on why he was taking more care dressing today than at other times in his life, that after all, the clothes he was wearing will be soon destroyed, he replied it was his wedding day, the day he will be united with the bridegroom, his Lord and Savior for all eternity, and he wanted to look his best. Bishop Fisher took his New Testament that had been always by his side, and making the sign of the cross, he motioned to the lieutenant that he was ready. Because he was too weak to walk, they carried him out of the tower on a chair. When they reached the place of his execution, he stood up from his chair, unaided, and looking up toward his Savior, his mother, and the whole heavenly court of angels and saints, and opened his Bible for the last time. He prayed, O oh Lord, this is the last time that I shall ever open this book. Please comfort me so that I, thy poor servant, may glorify thee in my last hour. Upon opening his Bible, what passage will appear to him but, Now this is eternal life, that they may know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom thou hast sent. I have glorified thee upon the earth. I have finished the work thou hast given me to do. And now glorify thou me, Father, with thyself, with the glory which I, I had before the world was with thee. John seventeen three to 5 When they tried to help him ascend the steps to the gallows, he refused, insisting he be allowed to go to his Lord under his own power. He mounted the steps with a spring to his step that belied his frail frame. As he climbed, the sun broke through the clouds and began to illuminate his face. There was a glow about him. As he reached the scaffold, he raised his arms, he said, Draw close to him and receive his light, and you shall never be discouraged. The executioner kneeled down and asked his forgiveness. The bishop consoled, I forgive you. With all my heart, and I trust you shall see me overcome this storm lastly. When he was stripped of his gown, his frail body looked like a skeleton. He turned to the people. Christian people, I have come forth to die for the faith of Christ's holy Catholic Church, and I thank God that so far I have not feared death. I now entreat you all to help and assist me with your prayers that at the very moment and instant when death strikes his blow, I may in that very moment stand steadfast with a weakening in any one point of the Catholic faith, free from any fear. And I beseech Almighty God of his infinite goodness to save the King and his realm, and that it may please him to hold his holy hand over it and send the King good counsel. He knelt down on both knees and prayed, after he recited the Te Deum and the Psalm In Te Domine Esperavi, the executioner bound a handkerchief over his eyes. Then this holy priest and bishop raised his hands and heart to heaven, said a few prayers, and laid his holy head on the block. When the executioner's axe struck him, severing his head from his body, 
The blood of this martyr burst forth with the powerful passion with which another sacrificial lamb had given up his life that his church might live. And the earth was covered with blood once more. And the church was nourished by that blood. And she lives today because a man chose to die rather than deny his Lord and his church. Henry's anger and hate followed the Holy John Fisher, priest, bishop, saint, and martyr to the very end. He had the bishop's body dumped into a grave without a shroud, without a Catholic burial, and his head impaled for 14 days on London Bridge so that all who passed could see. They recounted it was as if he was still alive. His face had such a peace about it. Then the king had his head thrown into the river to make room for his friend Thomas More's head. May 1935, almost four years after his death, John Fisher and his friend and fellow martyr Thomas More solemnly joined the number of saints who had lived and died for their God and church. Throughout England and Wales and parts of Scotland, July 9th is celebrated as the feast day of these two martyrs till today. And King Henry VIII, St. Thomas More, Martyr, 1478-1535. God was to raise up two Thomases in England, one who will give his life to stave off royal aggression against the church for 350 years, only to see that aggression rise again and require another Thomas martyr's blood to try to save the faithful children of God from separation from their and his church. It would seem, for the foolish, it was in vain the second time. But as we see whole congregations with their pastors coming back home to the Roman Catholic Church, we cry out, Martyrs of God, rest in peace. The cross is coming together. Division is at an end. Alleluia. Both Thomases, Thomas Beckett and Thomas More, were chancellors. Each loved God more than his earthly king. There are many parallels. They just take place at a different time in church and world history. Thomas Beckett was born between the 12th century and the turbulent tide of the Renaissance. Thomas More was born during a time of deceptive, devastating revolution, erroneously called the Reformation, with protest, politics, and disobedience. Thomas Beckett was a churchman, Thomas More a layman. God would use these two loyal sons of the church. Thomas More was born February 6, 1478. His father was a lawyer and judge. He fared so well in school, at age 13, he was sent to Oxford where he entered Canterbury College. Thomas' father was strict with him, giving him money only for the merest necessities. Although I am sure the young Thomas was not too happy with this discipline and austerity, it served him well as he matured. Thomas did very well at the university. But after two years, his father called him home. He studied for the next five years and in 1501 was admitted to the bar. He, three short years later, entered Parliament. He was brilliant, successful, and popular. This did not seem to satisfy him, though. He felt drawn to the life of the Carthusian monks. He even thought of becoming a friar minor of the Order of St. Francis but he could not hear the Lord calling him to either the monastic life or to the secular priesthood. He ardently loved the priesthood, but he wanted to be sure he would not be anything but faithful to God in whatever vocation he called him to. He said to be an unworthy priest was the last thing he would ever desire. In 1505, he married. He was highly regarded as a man of the world, but he had none of that contempt for ascetism that was so prevalent in the Renaissance. From the time he was 18 years old, he wore a hair shirt, used the discipline on Fridays, assisted at daily mass, and recited the little office every day. His controversial friend 
Erasmus said of him that he never knew anyone so indifferent to food. Thomas married Jane Colt, the eldest daughter, although he was attracted to her younger sister. But because he knew it would bring grief and shame to Jane if her younger sister married first, he married her. He was never sorry for his choice and loved his wife dearly. They have four children. Their home was a place filled with people of learning and accomplishment. It would appear it was only for the elite or the highbrow. But that was not the case. He, his family, and all their servants prayed together each night before retiring. They all ate together at mealtime and heard Holy Scripture read and explained. They all shared on the word and what it meant in their lives. Thomas had a profound sense of humor. His home was a place of joy and fun, but he did not allow car playing or rolling dice. He bequeathed a chapel to his parish church, and even after he became chancellor, he sang in the choir, wearing a surplice, like the other members of the choir. Whenever there was a woman in labor, whether in his home or in the village, more would begin praying and would not stop until someone arrived telling him that she had successfully given birth. He would visit the poorest of the poor, taking the alleys, lest he be detected. He was a truly a living example of the gospel which tells us to not let our deeds be known in the light of day. He often invited his poor neighbors to dine with him and his family. He rarely invited the rich and most never the nobility. Now this did not preclude him from inviting great minds or martyrs to be like John Fisher or controversial figures like Erasmus. St. Thomas More defended his friendship with Erasmus. He did not find the shrewd intent and purpose he found in Tyndale. He said that rather he found that Erasmus detested and abhorred the, her the errors and heresies that Tyndale plainly thought and abide by. And because of this, he said, Erasmus was his friend still. But as we will see later on, if he had not truly believed this, If he thought that Erasmus had gone against the church, more would have defended the church against him, as he would against King Henry VIII. More's idyllic life soon came to a crashing end. His wife Jane died, leaving him with four small children. He remarried within a few weeks, a lady seven years his elder, a good housewife with lots of good common sense, someone he could trust with his children. Although she could not take the place of his love, his Jane, their life was a good one. Having heard of him, King Henry VIII and his Cardinal Wolsey, one of the most important men in the realm, were determined to have more services at court. Thomas More was not too enthusiastic about it. Although he was not diametrically opposed to the position, he was not looking forward to being in court with the king and his entourage stating that the good life was definitely not there. But he obeyed his sovereign and was so well accepted and trusted, he, after many advancements, became Lord Chancellor, replacing the now disgraced Wolsey. Moore's advice was held in high regard. He proved himself an able and prudent judge in deep and important matters that will arise at court. He was able to see both sides of a question and try to satisfy both sides, but never by compromising his values. He was considered by all a gentleman of great learning in law, art, and divinity, as good a courtier as a Christian man and saint can be, and that does not mean that he was not a very good one. King Henry was very fond of St. Thomas More, and this affection was shared by Thomas for his king but he had no illusions about his king. Now, when Thomas More was appointed chancellor, he had been busy writing against Protestantism, particularly in rebuttal to Tyndale and his writings. Thomas More's attitude towards heretics was moderate, hating the heresy, but not the heretics. He was very cautious about the laity reading the Bible in the vernacular. As he judged, it could lead to misinterpretation. He strongly advised no such books be read without the ordinary's approval. 
when King Henry VIII demanded the clergy acknowledge him as protector and supreme head of the Church of England, Thomas More immediately wished to resign as chancellor, but he was persuaded to remain in order to give his attention to the matter of the king's annulment to Catherine of Aragon, or as he was called, the king's divorce. St. Thomas More upheld the validity of the king's marriage to Catherine, but requested he be allowed to stand aside from the controversy. When he was asked to present the case to Parliament, he refused to render his opinion. As we all try to do, he was trying to skirt the issues, but he would soon find it to be impossible. In 1532, the king imposed a decree forbidding the clergy to prosecute heretics or to hold any assembly without his permission, a clear interference of state and church, a matter resolved centuries before by the church that the state could not interfere with the church and its matters. Then he had a bill passed in Parliament that the first fruits due the Holy See was to be withheld. Now St. Thomas More could not sideswipe this issue. This went way back to the law of Moses, which stated that the first produce of men and animals and whatsoever was sown in the field was to be given to the Lord. St. Thomas More openly opposed all these measures, and the king was furious. On May the 16th, after having served only three years, St. Thomas More handed in his resignation as chancellor, and the king accepted it. Without his earnings as chancellor, he and his family were reduced to poverty with barely enough to eat, but they never lost their joy. St. Thomas More refused to go to the coronation of Anne Boleyn. His enemies, those who had envied him and his former position with the king, took this opportunity to taunt him, accusing him as they did St. John Fisher of all sorts of crimes. Praise God! The lords insisted on hearing St. Thomas More's defense themselves, so the king retracted the charges. But the time was now approaching when nothing would help St. Thomas More. March 30th, 1534, a law was passed requiring all subjects of the king to take an oath re recognizing the succession to the throne of the king and Anne Boleyn's offspring. King Henry added, this was to nullify his union to Catherine of Aragon, that it had never been a true marriage, and that no foreign authority, prince or potentate, had any authority to repudiate this. To refuse to take this oath or to oppose it in any way was an act of high treason. This came on top of the Pope the week before, declaring the marriage of King Henry and Catherine to be valid and irrevocable. Many Catholics took the oath with this reservation, as far as he be not contrary to the law of God. April 13, Sir Thomas More and Bishop John Fisher refused to sign the oath. St. Thomas was remanded to the custody of the Abbot of Westminster. A lord close to the king tried to dissuade him from taking any drastic action against Saints Thomas More and John Fisher but he refused to compromise, and the oath was once again tendered to Thomas More and John Fisher. They refused to sign. They were both in prison in the tower. St. Thomas spent the next 15 months there writing loving, faith-filled letters to his family. They begged him to do as the king ordered, but all their pleading fell on deaf ears. February 1st, 1535, the acts of supremacy were to go into operation. This gave the king the title of only supreme head of England. When in April Cromwell came to St. Thomas asking him his opinion of the bill, he refused to give it. May 4th, his daughter was allowed to visit him for the first time. They witnessed the first three Carthusian monks and their companions go to their martyrdom. When Cromwell and others returned and again taunted him to comment on the statute, they made sport of him because he remained silent. June 19th, the second group of Carthusian monks were martyred. June 19th, Bishop John Fisher was beheaded on Tower Hill. June 28th, Sir Thomas More was indicted and tried in Westminster Hall, 
By this time, he was too weak to stand and had to sit during the proceedings. The same witness that had falsely accused St. John Fisher of speaking against the king falsely testified against St. Thomas More, alleging that he had spoken to him against the acts of supremacy. As had St. John Fisher, St. Thomas maintained that he had remained silent and had not shared any opinion with Rich or anyone else. He was found guilty and condemned to death. Now, something you have to understand, this was not legal. So as the church is attacked and we lose our religious rights, our other rights will follow. At last, St. Thomas More spoke up. He had not before, afraid he would not be up to martyrdom, fearing he was a weak sinner. He did not want to tempt the Lord. But now, at last, he spoke. He proclaimed that no temporal Lord, sovereign, could or ought to be head of the church. He told the lords that he would pray for them, and as St. Paul had persecuted St. Stephen and went on to become a saint, he would pray that someday they would all rejoice in heaven together. He said his last farewell to his son and daughter. Early Thursday morning, on July 6th, Sir Thomas Pope came to warn him that he was to die at nine o'clock in that morning. St. Thomas More thanked him and told him he would pray for King Henry. He held his weeping friend in his arms, consoling him. The words I hear echoing through the tower are, Lord, make me an instrument of your peace. O Master, grant that I may never seek so much to be consoled as to console, to be understood as to understand, to be loved as to love with all my soul. Dressing in his finest clothes, love walked to the scaffold on Tower Hill, consoling people on the way, never once angry or sad. He even joked with the executioner to make him feel better. When it was time for him to speak, he asked the people for their prayers that he would be worthy to die a martyr's death. He told them he was dying rather than deny the Holy Roman Catholic Church. He said that he was the king's good servant, but God's first. He said the miserere, he kissed the headsman and assured him he was willingly dying for the faith, and this from a man who did not think he would have the courage to face his executioner. He covered his own eyes and adjusted his beard, and he was beheaded. He was 57 years old. His body was buried somewhere in the church inside the tower, and his head placed where St. John Fisher's head had been. He was beatified with other English martyrs in 1886 and canonized in 1935. It has been said that even if he could not die a martyr, he would have been declared a saint. He was from first to last a holy man who lived his prayer. Give me, good Lord, a longing to be with thee, not for the avoiding of the calamities of this wicked world, nor so much for the avoiding of the pains of purgatory, nor of the pains of hell neither, nor so much for the attaining of the joys of heaven, as even for a very love of thee. Please load our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Here is how to download our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Simply with your iPhone or Android device, go to the App Store, search for Bob and Penny Lord app, and download it. It's that simple. Here's what you can do with our free Bob and Penny Lord app. Number one, the, there's a link to our marketplaces, our websites, uh, our uh, blog, and this podcast. The second link is to our Bob and Penny Lord TV channel where you can access all of our videos as seen on EWTN, plus a whole lot more. Thank you very much.